<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. How are you all? All right, so welcome to First Aid AMC MCQ free two week session again. So, so far we have been doing a lot of free sessions with you guys, right? And I'm hoping that you have enjoyed the sessions. I'm hoping you have learned things that you wanted to learn. And most importantly, like when we take a theory class, we make sure that you you understand each and everything about that topic. And we go through the important topics that can appear in your exam. And also after finishing a theory class, like we have done cardiology for you, we do a question solve class based on cardiology. And you also have had a random question discussion session, right? And that was with Dr. Rabia. I'm hoping that you have also liked that. So this is how our, our course is going to work. There will be theory-based question discussion after finishing the theory. And then there will be every week two classes on random question solve. Okay? So this is start with our cardiology question solve class. Okay, so starting with the first question, if any of you have any questions like Dr. Muid, just ask it at the end of the class if you're having any trouble with, with, with anything. So we don't post any video in Facebook because you are a part of the course, uh, everything you will get it in our portal. So you must have gotten access to the portal and the, in the portal we, po we, we post all the videos of the recorded classes. and. For the free two week sessions, we are also posting the recordings on, on our official group, which is First Aid AMC MCQ. Okay, but otherwise, you are a part of the course. I would recommend you to get access to our portal and start just watching the videos there. Okay. All right, let's start the first question. So, 17 year, 17 year old male was running a race and suddenly collapses on the floor uh, to increase the volume. My volume should be fine. Let's see that if it, yeah. So my volume is 100 in here. So it must be in your end that your volume might be lower down. So you can increase it also in your end. So if you are having trouble to hear me, I can see my, my audio is fine in here. So. 17-year-old male was running a race and suddenly collapses on the floor. Luckily, someone was there and performed CPR as patient did not have a palpable pulse and resuscitated him. Upon arrival to the ED, it is revealed that his father died at the age of 28, which is a very important clue. He is now alert asymptomatic. ECG was non-eventful. He is anxious to go home. What would you do next? So they're asking about the next appropriate step in here. So you have got a 17 year old, so it's a teenage patient, had got a syncopal attack while racing, and also ended up getting a CPR. So, and also you have found a very important finding that there is a sudden cardiac death at, at, in the family, and that was his father. So do you want to send him home and arrange an outpatient consult with a cardiologist? Send him home without doing anything. Admit and refer for cardiologist team consultation. You want to do an outpatient echo or a, just do a stress echo. So what do you want to do now? I can see many of you are confused between C and E. It's good that at least you know what to do. Now, think about this case. Sorry. Think about this case that this patient, the first thing, always remember, what they're asking about the next step. What is the next step for this patient? Because you are in the emergency department, and in emergency department, you would not be able to organize a stress echo by yourself. A stress echo is a very specialist level investigation. And if you want to 
if you want to actually do that, it has to be done by a cardiologist. So for this kind of patient, you would admit the patient and then consult with the cardiologist team. And then cardiologist will come and review the patient. And because this was a near death problem, right? Patient was dead because there was no palpable pulse and he needed a CPR. And if it happens again, and if you send the patient home, then you, you're screwed, right? So you can't send this patient home without doing anything. It's not ideal even to organize the outpatient stress echo for this patient. And even one other thing is that we never do a stress echo before doing a baseline, baseline echo or a resting echo. So you would not just go or you would not just jump to a stress echo in this patient. You would first do a just a, like a resting echocardiogram and see if you can find out any abnormality there. And the last resort would be a stress echo. So this is not your decision in the emergency department. So that will be decided by the cardiologist. So best approach in here would be first admit the patient, then cardiologist consult. And if cardiologist want to do a echocardiogram, then cardiologist will do a echo. If cardiologist want to do a stress echo, then also they will do it. Okay, clear? I thought referral will take time after admitting. That was what confusing me. No, it's not like that. So Australian hospital works in this way that in the emergency department, you will be just taking a history for this patient. You have already organized ECG and everything. You are concerned about a condition which can be either a, it's a HOCOM, so it's a, either a A2CM or it could be a prolonged QT syndrome. But if it was a prolonged QT syndrome, then ECG was, ECG would be able to find this out, right? So it is not a prolonged QT syndrome. It is most likely a case of A2CM or HOCOM. So in this situation, once you think something like that, and because of this urgent nature of this condition, in the emergency department, you're, you will give a call to the cardiologist team, and then cardiologist will come to the emergency department. So it happens within, within minutes to hours. So cardiologist will come and review this patient, and then if cardiologist want to admit this patient under cardiac team, he will do it. Okay, so there is no, no problem with any time or anything in here. Okay, but if it was a GP setting, then yes, if you have to send this patient to a cardiologist, that can take a time. It is not a GP setting. It is an emergency department, which is in a, which is in a hospital. So in hospital, there will be cardiologist and you can easily, you can easily consult a cardiologist over there. And again, Dr. Muir, you don't need to do an outpatient echo before admitting this patient. So what will happen? This patient will be admitted in the cardiac team and cardiac team will organize the echocardiogram for the patient while the patient is inpatient. And not necessarily cardiologists need to do an echo before admission. Cardiologist, even based on what he has got, he can admit the patient and then do the echo. In many hospitals, doing echo is not like a very, very straightforward case. It takes some time, right? So you'll just just admit the patient, organize the echo while inpatient, and then go from there. Yeah, so answer is C here. So if patient refused to be admitted, so this is very unusual, like a patient will refuse something like this. A patient, patients are not like this in Australia because they know that this can be quite serious. And if you say it is serious, they would be admitted most of the time. But if patient doesn't want to be admitted, you can't keep him there. So you will discuss about why it is important for the patient to be admitted. And if still patient wants to go, then you don't have anything to do. Patient can self-discharge himself. And you just need to ask the patient to sign a letter that you have discussed everything, but he's still is still getting information about the urgency of the condition, patient is happy to go home. So that's fine. You can't forcefully keep a patient admitted.
No, ECG would not be done by a cardiologist team. You, as part of the emergency department, it has to be done in emergency. So a cardiology team will not come in the ED to do an ECG. Okay, so very unlikely to happen like that. And I can see Dr. Kimboy Kibart. Uh, you are you are using a. Um, I think it's kind of an emoji that you are using. Can you stop using that? It's just like doing some nuisance in here. Okay, so let's move on. Any questions with this, this one? Everyone clear? Moving on to the next. A young athlete presents with history of sudden syncope and dyspnea. ECG shows left ventricular hypertrophy. Patient's father had sudden death at very young age. So again, similar scenario. What will be your initial treatment? So sudden syncope in a young athlete, family history positive. So it is obviously a case of HOCM. So what will you do next? Verapamil, septal myomectomy, defibrillator, low molecular weight heparin or adenosine. Very good. So most of you remember that if it is HOCM, so we discussed this case in our class that it causes diastolic dysfunction. So for a diastolic dysfunction, ideally the treatment of choice is either a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, right? So this patient, we can see that it is most likely a HOCM case as well. And in here we have got verapamil. So verapamil is a rate limiting calcium channel blocker. So if there was beta blocker and calcium channel blocker both in the option, what would you choose? Beta blocker, okay? Because that's the first line for this kind of condition. If beta blocker is not in the option, then we would go for calcium channel blocker. Next question. A young girl, 15 year old, collapsed during exercise and her father had HOCM. After ECG and echo, you found no abnormality. What will you do next? See that I'm trying to show you in how much different way a question can come in your exam. So halter, stress, echo, repeat echo now, or you want to do a repeat echo after three years. Very good. So most of you are with a stress echocardiogram. That's right. So we discussed this also in our class that if you think that this is highly suspicious for HOCM, and even after if you do a resting echo, it comes normal, your next step would be to do a stress echocardiogram. Okay. Very good. Next one. And we will finish HOCM with this. A nine-year-old male running, was running and playing football, suddenly collapsed on the floor. Upon arrival to the ED, it is revealed that his father died early, now alert and asymptomatic. What would you do next? Alter, stress echo, repeat echo after three years, ECG and echocardiogram. So they're asking that what do you do next? Very, very good. So you got this, this one. So this will be ECG in here. Obviously, you would not jump to echocardiogram before doing an ECG in, the, in, in any scenarios, right? Even in the previous question, you have seen that they have done an ECG first. So ECG will be your first thing that you would do. Okay, so that's all about HOCM. Now, moving on to the next question, a 16-year-old male who presents with ejection murmur in second left intercostal space, which of the following is likely to be the diagnosis? So, ASD, so our at atrial septal defect with aortic stenosis, ASD with mitral stenosis, ASD with pulmonary hypertension, 
ASD with aortic regurgitation. This is a tricky case. We know that ejection murmur in aortic stenosis, but that's not the case in here because this is the option is not about aortic stenosis. So that will that's here, right? Now there's a few other things that you need to also consider that why this patient has got this patient has got ejection murmur in the second left intercostal space. So if you see one thing. Remember, I told you aortic stenosis murmur because it is start, it comes from your left heart, but it mainly goes to the right. So aortic stenosis murmur you get in the right second intercostal space, not in the left. So this patient has got it on the left. So aortic stenosis should not be your first thing that you should look for. Now I will discuss this, and many of you are correct. I can see many of you are choosing the right option. So let's start with atrial septal and ventral and ventricular septal defect, and then we move forward. So first ASD. So atrial septal defect means that you understand that if this is the heart, and this is the atrial septum, right? And somehow, if a patient has got a defect in here, then what can happen? And this is the pulmonary artery. So because the left heart has got increased pressure, blood will flow from left side to the right side. And then from, from the right atrium, blood will come to the right ventricle. And from right ventricle, more and more blood will go to the pulmonary artery. Okay, and because of that, patient can develop pulmonary hypertension. And what is that murmur? So actual septal defect, if you see here, it gives a systolic ejection murmur along the left mid to upper sternal border. So that's what we have got in this patient. So we have got a systolic ejection murmur in the left second intercostal space. Right? So let's say ASD murmur, and ASD can get complicated with pulmonary hypertension. Okay? So that's what we have got. Now, if we think about other options that we have here, we talked about aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis, it gives murmur, but it doesn't give a murmur on the left intercostal space, so it is unlikely. Same with the mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis murmur is in your left fifth intercostal space in the apex okay not in the second intercostal space aortic regurgitation the murmur is on the most of the time on the left fourth intercostal space okay and again mitral stenosis murmur is not a systolic murmur or not a ejection murmur so this would be a ejection systolic murmur so mitral stenosis is a mid diastolic murmur as we know and aortic regurgitation is an early diastolic murmur, right? So that means that these are not the case anyway. So even if you know some of the common murmur, you would be able to do an exclusion, and you can come to this diagnosis, even if you don't know this, OK? And on the top of that, we know that ASD gives this kind of murmur, and ASD can complicate with pulmonary hypertension, OK? Very tricky case, but if you understand the pathophysiology, then it's not very hard. Pulmonary hypertension doesn't give a murmur, but you can get a palpable pito. That's right. And we will discuss about this ventricular septal defect actual septal defect in our pediatric cardiology class. Okay, not today. Moving on, a young guy while playing cricket suddenly had syncopal attack without any convulsive feature. So suddenly he had a syncopal attack. 
Soon he spontaneously recovered and started fielding and continue playing rest of the game. What was the cause of syncope? Vesovagal syncope, cardiac syncope, epilepsy, neurogenic syncope, postural hypertension. So what is syncope? Syncope is a sudden loss of consciousness and there are lots of causes of syncope. There are cardiogenic syncope, there are neurogenic syncope, and then there are vesovagal syncope. Lots of lots of causes of syncope is there. How to differentiate between these? Always remember, cardiac syncope is patient will get sudden loss of consciousness without any prodromal feature. And then they will lose consciousness. And then when they regain consciousness, it will patient will not have any drowsiness or any confusion. So cardiogenic syncope means sudden syncopal attack. And then once patient regain consciousness, they are totally fine. Whereas if it is a case of vesovagal syncope, patient will say that patient was running or playing in a hot sunny weather, or maybe patient was standing for a long time. And then the patient will have some prodromal feature. And those prodromal feature would be feeling of lightheadedness, dizziness. And they would know that they are going to fall. So this prodromal feature will be there in vesovagal syncope. And then they fall, they lose consciousness. And when they regain consciousness, it, all the, there will be gradual regain of consciousness as well. Okay, So that's vesovagal. Now, why it is not epilepsy? Because they already said in here that there is no convulsive feature. So it is not epilepsy, obviously. Not vesovagal because it was sudden. What is postural hypotension? Postural hypotension, it also give, can give syncope. But it's a condition in which there is a sudden drop of blood pressure when patients change their position. So if a sitting blood pressure was let's say 140 by 80. And when you ask the patient to stand up, the systolic blood pressure falls, falls more than 20 or diastolic blood pressure falls more than 10. That's the time you can diagnose them as postural hypotension. So if the seating blood pressure was 140 by 80, and let's say when you ask the patient to stand up, the blood pressure is 110 by 80. So systolic has dropped more than 20. So that's your push, postural hypotension. But there is nothing written in here about posture change, nothing written about blood pressure. So it is unlikely. So this is a cardiac syncope anyway. So we have written in here, if there is post ictal state, then seizure. So we know that how to differentiate between a seizure and syncope. Seizure patient will obviously have a jerking movement. Now we say that if there is prodermal feature, then it is vesovagal. If no prodermal and patient recover Im immediately, more with cardiogenic. Okay. And sometimes we also say that neurogenic, neurogenic syncope also it happens suddenly and it can take minutes. For the patient to regain consciousness okay whereas in cardiogenic syncope patient will come back in second and neurogenic syncope can be due to a lot of condition it can be due to a stroke it can be due to even vesovagal syncope can be the cause so i would say that always remember one thing that cardiac syncope happens suddenly and consciousness will be regained also suddenly Okay, without any confusion. If there is a confusion, especially if a patient has jerky movement, that's epilepsy. And if there was a prodromal feature, like lightheadedness before the fall, that's likely to be vesovagal. Okay? Yeah, TIA can cause a neurogenic syncope also. And prodromal features are mainly lightheadedness, feeling sweaty, sometimes blurry vision, those are the prodromal features. And in cardiac syncope, patient goes suddenly, so patient had a sudden syncopal attack, 
like this patient, you can see, patient was playing cricket, suddenly had a syncopal attack, and then when he is spontaneously recovered, started fielding and continuing playing. That means he was totally fine after that. So that's how the cardiac syncope looks like. And this kind of thing can be due to a lot of reasons. We can't be totally sure that what has caused this cardiac syncope. It could be congenital heart disease, that's right. It can be even in a patient with HOCM who come, they can get this kind of syncope, very common. It can be any arrhythmia this patient is having. So we can't be totally sure. If this patient needs to have an ECG, echo, to find out any structural defect, okay? But all we know that it is, there is something going on in the heart. And other syncope will be discussed in neurology class, so not today, like micturition syncope, reflex syncope, cough syncope, those will be discussed later on. And I have put a link for you here. So this is a very good guideline about all the syncope that can come in your exam. So please go through this link in your own time. Next question, a 45-year-old male presented to the emergency department with left-sided chest pain radiating to the left arm and jaw. There was no ECG changes and troponin is negative four hours since the onset of chest pain. He has been on sildenafil for erectile dysfunction, metformin for diabetes, ramipril for hypertension, what would be the most appropriate next treatment for this patient? So, this patient having a very typical acute coronary syndrome chest pain. Left sided chest pain has been there for four hours, no ECG changes, troponin is still normal. So, we can't be sure that if this patient is having acute ST elevated MI, or is it a non ST elevated MI, or it's just an unstable angina. Okay? All we know at this moment is that everything is so far negative, right? So the treatment will be focusing on, on the pain management in this case, because there was no ECG or troponin changes just yet. So are you going to offer this patient nitrate, heparin, morphine, beta blocker, paracetamol? Very good. This patient will get a morphine first because it's still patient having, having the pain. You can see that still patient having pain in here. So now you remember our discussion, like we had a very detailed discussion about cardiac, cardiac chest pain, myocardial infarction and everything. We talked about monotherapy, right? So, and we also told you that after aspirin, your next thing would be to start the patient with let's say like if it is a st elevated mi you have to send the patient for for pci if it is non-st elevated mi then we talked about heparin but this question is a little bit different why because there is nothing in here that's letting us know that this patient having a having a st elevated mi so we can't be sure on anything yet now the best option in this case would be if there was a aspirin in the option Right? If there was aspirin, then that would be your first thing that you would choose because that's not in the option. We can see that beta blocker paracetamol is not the, the usual treatment for this kind of case. Heparin, only time we would do a heparin if we know that this is a non ST elevated MI. And we have got morphine and nitrate in the option. Both of them can be a good thing for the pain. But we can't give nitrate in this patient. What is the reason? This patient is on Viagra. So patient who is on sildenafil, you can't give them nitrate. So it is contraindicated. So that's why it is not also an option to choose. Okay? So morphine will be your best option out of all these five. Very good. So you are you actually understanding me. That's very good. And I can see many of you are, you are choosing the right option. So a 72-year-old male presented with severe chest pain radiating to the back. 
on cardiac exam you notice diastolic murmur chest x-ray shows white mediastinum ecg given what is the most appropriate management so severe chest pain radiating to the back diastolic murmur white mediastinum which is not a good sign have a look on the ecg now we haven't done the ecg with you yet so it might be quite tricky for you but just to give you an idea what we look for so this v1 to v6 is chest lips and we look for any st elevation right and this is called p wave then this is the qrs t so this p wave this is qrs and that's t wave see this line this is called st wave and this whole line is called isoelectric line so this st wave either it can go up like this or it can go down like this so when it goes down it is st depression and when it goes up that's st elevation so if you look at v1 where is the isoelectric line here and so what happened with the st st has got depression so there is st depression here in v2 st depression in v3 st depression right and we can see that in v4 v5 v6 there is a little bit of elevation v5 there is obvious st elevation and v6 also st elevation but most importantly if you look over here in lead 2 3 avf which is the inferior lead lead 2 3 and avf you can see a very prominent st elevation so this is st elevation this is st elevation this is st elevation so this patient has got a st elevated mi also now the tricky part in this case is that this patient has got st elevated mi and along with that this patient also has got a aortic dissection because of this pain severe chest pain radiating to the back extra showing widening of the mediastina many times aortic dissection it can get complicated with acute myocardial infarction also especially if it happens in the aortic arch or in the ascending aorta so especially if it's mainly happening at the origin of or at the origin of the aorta then sometimes it can involve the coronary arteries so it's not uncommon to get both aortic dissection and an acute mi yeah so this is the inferior mi because it's mainly on 2 3 avf so what will you do for this kind of patient are you going to start alteplase, which is a thrombolytic? Thrombolytic is contraindicated in aortic dissection because it is just going to make it worse. Patient will just bleed and, and it will be life threatening. Do you want to give aspirin and intravenous morphine? We will keep it in our hand. Give morphine, beta blocker, arrange for transesophageal echo. Let's keep it in our hand. Refer the patient to the cardiology clinic. Now, yes or no? Now, if, if this is a GP setting and, and you are just doing referring the patient to the cardiology clinic, that's not more enough. Okay, because referring mainly means that if you are a GP setting and you are sending the patient to the cardiologist, that can take even a month. Okay, same even if it is the emergency department, you, would be, you have to do something right now before you before you call the cardiac team you can't just call the cardiac team and cardiac team will come after an hour to see the patient in an hour this patient can be dead so it's not the not the choice or the best choice for this patient and they are asking the most appropriate management for this patient not the initial management so that's also not the best option urgent mri of cervical and thoracic spine that's nothing to do with this case so rule that out so you've got these two options anyway. Out of these two, what looks better for you? Obviously the option C, because the patient has got severe chest pain, so you're giving morphine. This patient has got aortic dissection, so obviously they would get a high blood pressure, so you, you can give beta blocker to keep the blood pressure down. 
And this patient will need an echocardiogram, which is a transesophageal echo, and that's mainly to diagnose aortic dissection. Okay. Yeah, even like because this LT place is a thrombolytic, thrombolytics will not be the best option. I'm not sure who, who you are, doctor. We have had a very detailed discussion about this LT place, the PCI in our cardiac class one. So I think you might have missed it. So if you have missed it, then please go through that class because there is a lot to understand about this thrombolytic and PCI. We have just taken the whole class on that. So please go through that. We have discussed when to give LT plays or ready plays, the thrombolytics and everything. So that will be the first thing that we must do. And is aspirin also contraindicated? Ideally, yes, because this patient, you can't give anything which can increase the bleeding risk. Okay. The, these patients, the underlying cause of MI is aortic dissection. So aortic dissection is the first priority of treatment. If you don't treat aortic dissection, these patients' MI will not be treated. Okay? So more priority in, in here is aortic dissection. And this is the widening of mediastinum on chest X-ray. You can see how wide is the mediastinum. And remember, we talked about aortic dissection, like type A and type B. So type A is up to this. So anything distal to the left subclavian artery, that's type B, right? And for type B, usually our first line treatment is antihypertensive, followed by surgery. Type A, surgery is the best choice. And also there is a good guideline in here about, about aortic dissections that's in med bullets. You can go through it. What is aortic dissection anyway, guys? So you can see that in aortic dissection, there is a tear in the aorta. And patient is just bleeding and bleeding. And there's a blood getting accumulated in a false lumen right and at one point patient can patient can have patient can have like a severe loss of blood that's the main problem now if you give something which can make the blood getting less clotted or blood gets more thinner what will happen patient will bleed more so we can't give anything which which will just make the bleeding worse so same with the aspirin same with anything which can increase the risk of bleeding The best test for aortic dissection is transesophageal echocardiogram. That's the, the definitive investigation. We say that if toe is not in the option, then CT angiogram will be the preferred option. Okay. In JM, both transesophageal echo and CT angiogram, both is written. All good, everyone. Any confusion? Next, an elderly man with multiple falls during the day, especially in the morning after waking up. ECG found left ventricular hypertrophy and multiple ventricular ectopics. Orthostatic hypertension was also noted. So orthostatic hypertension and postural hypertension is same. How would you investigate this patient further? So what you have got is that it's a multiple fall in an elderly patient, especially it looks like a postural hypotension also because patients mainly having the fall in the morning. But it's not just postural hypotension. You can see that ECG found multiple ventricular ectopics, left ventricular hypertrophy. So are you going to do a repeated measurement of blood pressure in supine and prone position? Or are you going to do 24-hour halter monitoring, serum electrolyte?
read the full thing. Now, obviously, if you, if you have done one orthostatic hypotension or one blood pressure check, that's not enough to diagnose. You need multiple reading where you will see the patient having a drop of blood pressure when they are changing position. So either patient will be sitting and you will, you will do a both sitting and sitting and lying. So either you can do sitting lying and and or, or sitting standing. So it has to be a change of position. Okay. Now they are saying supine and prone. So what is supine and prone position? Both lying position. So measuring this patient's Blood pressure in supine and prone is not going to do anything. So that's a trick, or you can see it's a trap in here. So you have to always read the full question. Otherwise, many of you will get tricked in the exam. If this case, if this option was in here, repeat measurement of blood pressure in sitting and standing position, then obviously we would choose that. Okay, that would be our next thing to do because we can't confirm orthostatic hypotension without doing multiple times. So this is not an option in here to choose. So what else we can choose here? The next best option will be a halter monitoring. Why? The reason behind it is that a patient who is elderly, even if you have done a ECG and it found some ventricular ectopic, which is just an abnormal bit, this patient can have underlying other arrhythmia. This patient can have hard block, which this resting ECG is not able to find at the moment. This patient can have a lot of other arrhythmia as well. So, and that can be also another factor in this patient's fall. So to find out about any missing arrhythmia, we can do a 24-hour halter monitor. Okay, so 24-hour halter monitor, it will be a device patient will be putting on, and it will check the patient's rhythm or it will just do a multiple ECG throughout this 24 hour time and patient will be doing just regular activities and that can give us any any kind of missing arrhythmia that we can't find out right now okay so halter monitor is a good test in that case good question dr jena so if there was an option of blood pressure in sitting and standing and then also the halter monitor is in the option. The next and best, both would be this, like a repeat measurement of blood pressure. Okay, because that's what you want to find out first. They don't usually give, give a best test or best investigations in this kind of cages. They always ask you, what will you do next? Okay, because there is no best in here. You just do one by one investigation. Okay, moving on to the next. A young patient has, has been getting multiple headaches, sorry, multiple lightheadedness and dizziness. And you see young patient. His clinical features are normal. Chest X-ray ECG normal. Halter monitor shows ventricular ectopics. What will you do next? So patient getting multiple lightheadedness, dizziness, everything else is normal. Except in the halter, you found patient having ventricular ectopics. So do you want to reassure the patient? You want to do an exercise tolerance test. You want to do a dobutamine-induced echo or plain echo. What will you do? Have a look on premature ectopic bits. Now, I know that we haven't discussed these cages in our class. That's why I kept in here so that I can discuss it anyway. So, premature or ectopic ventricular complex. So, this is very common. If you do the ECG of a patient, elderly, young, you will get this ventricular ectopic beat in, in a lot of patients. And most of this time, it is asymptomatic. Symptoms sometimes can be noticed at rest in bed at night. And sometimes some drugs can cause it, especially detoxing is a very notorious drug to cause this. And always look for evidence of ischemic heart disease, mitral valve prolapse, hydrotoxicosis, etc. So you can see this is the question, if symptomatic, but otherwise well, 
with a normal chest X-ray and an ECG, reassured the patient. So that's what we have got in here. Our patient is symptomatic, but everything else is normal. ECG, chest X-ray normal. So what will you do? We can reassure this patient. Okay. Now never start treatment, especially never start treatment with a antiarrhythmic drug without doing a baseline echocardiogram on a patient. So if, if we think that well, the patient having a, like a very troubling PVC or premature ventricular complex, we can, and if we think that this patient might need an antiarrhythmic drug, in that case, you can do an echo. But even before echo, for this patient, you can try beta blocker like atenolol or metoprolol. That sometimes can help anyway. So it's not must to do an echo in this patient. The baseline investigation should be a chest X-ray and an ECG. Okay. So this patient, actually, the the question came from JM, as you can see. Okay. Any question? I can see many of you are wanting to do an echo. Young patient, everything normal. ECG, chest X-ray normal. Halter monitor just showing ventricular ectopy. There is no need of doing an echocardiogram in this patient, okay? Because you are not going to start this patient with antiarrhythmic. If you want, you can start the patient with beta blocker. Even with beta blocker, if it's still the patient having symptoms, then you can do an echo and send the patient to a cardiologist who can consider giving an antiarrhythmic medication, okay? Why, will, why we are going to do a stress test? What is the reason? Dr. Suraya, why do you want to do it? And what are you looking for? Isn't that prodromal symptom is symptomatic? No, the thing is that this is a young patient, okay? So young patient, we normally would not go for a stress test. A stress test is for someone who has got a chest pain and especially middle-aged elderly patient who has multiple cardiovascular risk factor. Those patients can get a stress test, not a young patient whose chest X-ray, ECG, everything is normal, okay? The other thing is that we already have seen from JM that even if the patient is symptomatic, which is in this patient lightheadedness and dizziness, otherwise well with a normal chest X-ray and the ECG, reassure the patient. So that is actually what we have got in our patient, and we will just follow the JM anyway. Okay, so there is nothing we need to do for this kind of PVC. It is usually quite a normal finding. All right, moving on to the next. A patient is on amlodipine, amiodarone, frusamide, aspirin, and having intermittent falls. ECG was given, looked like hyperkalemia. And they're asking which one of the following can be the cause of hyperkalemia in this patient. Now, the only reason why I have put this question in here is that to, to tell you something. In your preparation, you will find out a lot of recalls. The recalls are, are questions which was most many times a, a person who has appeared the exam, he or she can think or remember a little bit about the question and, and they just write something. Many times those questions are not right. Many times there is a lot of information are missing. And I've seen a lot of candidates, they just follow those recalls. They want to even memorize the recalls rather than understanding the topic. Why we do this question? The reason is we want you to know the topic. We want you to understand how your theory knowledge can help with question solve in the exam. But it's not about memorizing these questions. It's, ne it's never like that. Okay? So don't waste your time 
on some of the controversial questions which has no meaning. Like this question, it's been a year, years and years, these questions we have seen, and we were not able to find a good guideline like why this question is given like this. Because none of these options actually is completely right. Okay? So, none of these actually gives hyperkalemia. Now, if you see here, frusamide is a diuretic which causes hypokalemia. Okay? So, it is unlikely to give hyperkalemia. Then we have got, again, there is a frusamide here. So, even if aspirin or amlodipine causes hyperkalemia, that will be counteracted by the hypokalemia done by frusamide. So, this two option is gone. This two option is the viable option, B or C. In my view, I know that amiodarone and amlodipine, this has a mild hyperkalemic effect. If you, want, if you ask me how they do it, I can't answer. Because there is no specific, specific answer to it. Okay? And there is no specific guideline I was... Like, I have tried my best to find out, but there is none. And I know that many of you might have also come across this question. There is no specific guideline about this. So, I would say that keep it in your mind that sometimes questions are there in, in, a, in a lot of Q-banks, in, in, in everywhere. There are some questions where, where it will feel very controversial. Don't waste your time on those questions. Okay? So, we know that amiodarone can cause a little bit of hyperkalemia. Amlodipine, very less likely. So based on that, I kept this as the option to choose. Okay? But again, there is no specific guideline that I can, I can give you for this. But if you ask me this question, this is also a drug and drug interaction. That, that has some explanation. So you... In exam, many times drug-drug interaction comes. It is very, very favorite topic for them. So you have got a patient who is on multiple drugs, including ramipril, amlodipine, hydrochlorothiazide, selecoxib, which is a NSAID, and asking about which combination making muscle weakness without any tenderness. So they are asking about which of these a, B, C can cause muscle weakness without tenderness in a patient. So, is it a ramipril and hydrochlorothiazide, amyloride ramipril, selecoxib hydrochlorothiazide? So, very easy to understand because hydrochlorothiazide it causes hypokalemia, right? So, if this causes hypokalemia, ramipril is an ACE inhibitor, it increases potassium. So both of them get counteract with each other. Same selecoxib, it can increase potassium, but again, hydrochlorothiazide will lower it down. So these two are counteractive. Amyloride is a potassium sparing diuretics like spironolactone, so that increases potassium. Same ramipril increases potassium. So this patient is getting two combination which can increase the potassium in this patient. And this patient probably got a hyperkalemia-induced muscle weakness. I'm sure you have heard that both hypo and hyperkalemia can cause muscle weakness. Okay? So this patient has most likely got that as well. Okay? Clear, everyone? Any question, guys? Everything good? You are understanding me, right? Last question, this one. This one is amyloride and ramipril. So, Amyloride is a potassium sparing diuretics, which increase potassium. Ramipril ACE inhibitor, so that's also increased potassium. So this patient has got hyperkalemia, 
and hyperkalemia can cause muscle weakness. Okay, both hypo and hyper can cause it, but we have found that these two A and C they counteract each other, so this will not be our option to choose. Okay, moving on to the next, you have got an ECG of an adult person presented with chest pain, cardiac enzyme and first ECG normal. Blood pressure initially was 120 by 70. After 8 hours of observation, now blood pressure is down to 89 by 50. An ECG showing supraventricular tachycardia with heart rate 150. What would you do? So I know that we haven't discussed supraventricular tachycardia, which we will do in our palpitation or ECG class. But to give you a baseline idea about SVT management, so supraventricular tachycardia is, is one of the commonest tachycardia that you can get. So the first line management is if the patient is stable or unstable. If the patient vitally unstable, like this patient, blood pressure is obviously low. So below 90 by 60 means patient is vitally unstable. So in a vitally unstable SVT, your treatment will be cardioversion. Basically, that's a shock. Now, if it is a stable SVT, in a stable SVT, first thing that you can try is called vagal stimulation. So you can do maneuvers which can stimulate the vagal nerve. And vagal nerve, when it is stimulated, it can reduce the heart rate. So this vagal stimulation you can do either by Valsalva maneuver, you can do carotid sinus massage, or even you can ask the patient to immerse their face in a cold running water. So any of these which can stimulate the vagal nerve will do. If vagal nerve stimulation doesn't help, then your next option will be IV adenosine. Okay, and you can try multiple doses of adenosine. If adenosine is not in the option, then you can try calcium channel blocker such as verapamil. And even after that, still patient is in SVT, then you go for cardioversion. So that's the step-by-step -step approach for SVT management in a stable patient. So this patient, you know that this patient has got an unstable SVT. So what will be the choice? Synchronized cardioversion. Okay. Here, everyone. Now, SVT usually will not cause no pulse. SVT usually patient will have pulse. Usually VT or VF patient, they don't have pulse. Okay. For those patients, you go for defibrillation. And any patient who doesn't have pulse, you start the patient with CPR first. And with CPR, next thing is defib. And again, like for AMC, MCQ, we try not to go in too much detail about things that is not important for the exam such as what is the difference between cardioversion and defibrillation. It's just a waste of time. But again, if you want to know, that's fine. But things, try to keep it as simple as possible, especially exam oriented. So what happens in cardioversion that this is, patient will be with a monitor, right? So synchronized cardioversion means that you will give shock to the patient whenever you can see the R wave on the screen. So you give the shock which will coincide with the R wave. That's synchronized cardioversion. But in defibrillation, it is a desynchronized shock. That means what happens in patient who has VT or VF? You, it's just a haphazard ECG. And you can't see R wave like this. For this, you will just give shock anytime you want. Okay, so that's defibrillation. Clear?
Okay, now we are going to take a five minute break. And after that, we will again start. Okay, thank you everyone.
All right, everyone, let's start again. Do we do cardioversion in SVT? Yes, we do cardioversion. And defib is usually in VT without pulse and in VFib. So ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia without pulse. Okay, we will discuss those things in our ECG class in little bit more detail. So don't worry. Next, a patient is on digoxin, bisoprolol, and thiazide. Long term history of hypertension and congestive cardiac failure with AF. Stopped taking medication for three weeks while on vacations. Now presents with edema up to his knees and a raised JVP of 4 cm but with clear chest sound. Blood pressure is elevated, pulse is irregular. What would you do as an initial management of this patient? So are you going to commence chrysamide only? Commence a spirolactin, metoprolol, digoxin bisoprolol, or recommends all medication. So this is a tricky case. So you can see that this patient has congestive cardiac failure and AF. And he has stopped his medication for three weeks. Now he is starting to get a decompensation. Or, but it is still not that bad. Why not bad? Because if it is bad, then patient would start to get shortness of breath, and especially when you do a lung auscultation, you would get bivasilar crepitation. But you have got a clear chest sound in here, which means that it is still not a pulmonary edema. And decompensated heart failure, the, one of the most important criteria is to have a, have a pulmonary edema, bivasilar crepitation. And having a leg edema up to the knees is not, not something which we need to start the medication straight away, like frisamide. What we do in this case is that most likely this, this edema up to the knee or raised JVP is because this patient has stopped taking all the medication. So currently, at this point, we would recommence all medication for this patient. And we will see that if the patient, this, this edema is getting better with this. Okay, if even after that, patient is still getting ongoing edema, then along with this medication, you would add frisamide. If frisamide doesn't help, then you can add a spironolactone in that way. The other question is that sometimes they change this question like they say that there is edema up to the knees, raised JPP, but also bivasilar crepitation. Now, when there is bivasilar crepitation, you have to start the patient with frusemide straight away. Okay, that means because it is, it is getting, it is going to get worse. You can't wait. But as long as there is no bivasilar crepitation, we are fine. We can restart all this medication and see if the patient's getting euvolemic again. Okay. The you have to understand one thing in here that we know that patient. Patient, we can't start beta blocker in, in, a, in a, like a hypervolemic patient. But the main part is, this is not the first time we are starting this medication for this patient. This patient was on this medication, but he has stopped taking it. So the likely chance that why this patient is not eovolemic at the moment is that because he needs this medication anyway. And you have a thiazide diuretics in here, which is going to help this patient with this edema as well. So there is no need to start the frisamide straight away. We can recommence everything. We can see if the patient's, at least the edema up to the knee is going down or not. So two things, if in this kind of cases, if you see that patient doesn't have bivasilar crepitation, the lung is fine, then you can start all the medication. If the patient, there is pulmonary edema, then obviously frisamide is must, okay? Next. So, Dr. Jinnad, what is to explain for digoxin in here? 
This patient was on digoxin already, and most likely the reason why he is on digoxin is that he is having congestive cardiac failure with air. That's the reason why he is on digoxin. Dr. Jainal, what what are you looking for on digoxin? No. So this patient, what we are going to monitor in digoxin, this patient, digoxin, patient did not take it for three weeks. So we are not looking for a digoxin toxicity or something like that, right? Or very unlikely to have have something. And the digoxin monitoring is not in the option. Again, in MC, MCQ, you don't think outside what is given in the option. Your option is the main thing that you think at that given time. If you start thinking about all other things about a particular topic, then the time you will start to get confused in the exam. In exam, you get a very minimal time to think and then come to a conclusion to choose an option. So always be focused on what's given on the option and that's it, nothing else, okay? But once you start the patient on digoxin, then yes, we will monitor the patient by doing a digoxin level and everything, but that's not the case in here. Okay, moving on, given ECG, so a ECG was given showing M spike QRS complex in all lips. And now the main thing is that this is just a writing of someone. So we can't be sure what was exactly given on the ECG. But we can see that there was M spike. So maybe there was either a right or left bundle branch block. But main thing is that we can see that it, there was an irregularly irregular pulse. That means they're talking about most likely F. And we can see heart rate is 150. Patient has a hypertension. Patient is only taking atorvastatin, which is a cholesterol medication. There is no chest pain. So what will you do in this patient? Will you start metoprolol, epixavan, which is a newer anticoagulant, warfarin, or verapamil? So the main thing is that it is most likely an atrial fibrillation case. In atrial fibrillation, the treatment depends on few things. So we haven't discussed this as well, we know, but this is actually a part of our ECG class. To give you a baseline idea, so in actual fibrillation, again, we need to know if the patient is unstable or stable. If the patient is unstable, then you have to go for cardioversion like SVT. If the patient is stable, then first you can try a rate control medication. And the rate control medication can be beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. Which one is better? Beta blocker. Second, if rate control is not helping, then you can give some rhythm control medication. And you have got antiarrhythmic medication for that. So which is either you can go for sotalol, placanide, or amiodarone. If that is still not helping, then you can go for cardioversion. So these are the options one by one that we can do for, for atrial fibrillation patient, okay? So for this patient, what will you do next? The next thing is, this is a AF patient, we need to control the rate. So to control the rate, we are going to go for a beta blocker. So that will be metoprolol in here, okay? Now, can it be WPW syndrome with AF? We don't know. The only time we can be able, we can know is that if there was an ECG given. So, based on the option, it doesn't seem like it was a WPW syndrome because WPW syndrome, you can't give any of this. You have to go for for amiodarone. Okay, so unlikely it was a case of WPW syndrome. And AM spike, it it can mean LBBB, that means left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block, depending on the ECG. 
We will discuss about this M spike in our ECG class. Moving on to the next one. So a middle-aged man with a known hypertension started feeling dizziness and he feels his heart is racing. So palpitation. It occurred after running. There was also a travel history few days ago. Right? He is on RB sartan and hydrochlorothiazide, so that's for hypertension and well control. No diabetes, blood pressure is fine, no postural change. Asking what is the most appropriate next investigation in this patient? So it's a case of a patient who is a known hypertensive but now having dizziness and palpitation. And there was a travel history positive and hypertension is fine, no diabetes. What what is your diagnosis? Yes, very good, Adriel. It can be a case of pulmonary embolism. Looking at it, that the main thing is that patient has got a travel history. Travel history is a very important clue. Most likely it was a long flight. Patient ended up getting a DVT. And with the DVT, it can get complicated with a pulmonary embolism. And the main feature of pulmonary embolism is feeling racing of the heart. So tachycardia, dizziness, even sometimes they can get chest pain, difficulty breathing. Those will be the main finding. So even looking at the option, you can see that there is CTPA D-dimer. So they are trying to look for that. And then there is thyroid and troponin. This patient hasn't got any chest pain. So doing a troponin is not indicated. Same THS doesn't go with feeling dizzy. So most likely our diagnosis is pulmonary embolism. Now pulmonary embolism is, a, is our respiratory class topic. We will discuss it in, in detail. There is a lot to learn from CTPA, which we will do later on. Just one second. As I said, guys, try not to draw anything on my screen, okay? Because it just doesn't look good. Okay? So, Please don't write or please don't use this screen for you, okay? So the main thing I was talking in here that in here, we are thinking about a likelihood of pulmonary embolism. And you can understand that patient, patient had a long travel, patient had a travel history recently, now having dizziness and racing of the heart, which goes with PE anyway. So I was saying that we will discuss pulmonary embolism in detail in our respiratory class because there is a lot to learn from this. But for now, always remember, if you suspect pulmonary embolism, your next and your best, both is CT pulmonary embolism. Sorry, CT, CTPA. So CTPA is your, your first thing that you would do in a patient who you suspect to, to have a pulmonary embolism. So CT pulmonary angiogram is, is a test where you insert a dye in a patient and then that dye goes into the pulmonary artery and it can definitely say if there is a block or if there is any kind of ischemia in, in the pulmonary artery or not. Okay, now there are a lot of other things about CTPA. There are some cases where we can't do CTPA. We do, D, uh, we do VQS scan. But this is not the part of our topic today. Okay. Now, other thing is D-dimer. D-dimer also, it can be done. But if you suspect that a patient has got pulmonary embolism, that fulfills the criteria of Wales score. And we say that if the Wales score is more than four, you have to go for CTPA. You don't need to do a D-dimer. And there's a lot to learn from Wales score also, but this patient, because your most likely diagnosis is DVT or PE, so that gets a three score. And this patient has got tachycardia. So 
that gets one score also. So four, four is already there. So you can just directly go for CTPA in this patient. D-dimer is not a specific test or it is not the best test for DVT or PE. So we try not to choose D-dimer in the exam. Okay. Yeah, in, in pregnancy, you would go for VQS scan. Same with kidney failure, you would go for VQS scan. Leave it for our class. We will discuss this in detail. Okay, the next one. You have got a 60-year-old male, 10 years history of hypertension, feeling dizzy and lightheadedness from this morning. When he was doing exercise, so this is an exercise-induced dizziness and lightheadedness. Smoker, so 20 cigarettes a day, drinks two to three glass of wine. Blood pressure is not bad. And you can see they have done, done both Seating and lying. It's not not even some usual drop in here. Currently on RB certain thiazide and aspirin. Symptom lasted for about two hours. ECG given showing SVT. Heart rate about 150. What was the cause of his presentation? So what do you think that this patient has got? got SVT. So is there any underlying reason it could be? Like, is it just dehydration because patient was exercising? Ischemic heart disease, hypertension, or alcoholic cardiomyopathy? Alcoholic cardiomyopathy is unlikely if they just drink two to three glass of wine. Let's say standard drink. Hypertension can be a cause, but this patient blood pressure is well controlled, so it should not be the sole reason. Between A and B, both can cause SVT. But you have to look at, at the whole scenario. This patient has, is a high, highly cardiac risk, right? Because it's a 60-year-old male, had hypertension, smoker, and also you can see that this was a exercise-induced. So likely chance it is cardiac-related rather than just dehydration. This same patient, if it was a 20-year-old male without any cardiovascular risk factor, having a SVT, we would choose dehydration. But this is, we can't just say it is dehydration. There is a likelihood of a ischemic heart disease in this patient as well. Okay, always look at the whole scenario when you choose an option in the exam. Is this making sense, guys? Yeah, so it is ischemic heart disease. Very good. Moving on to next. Okay, good question. Ischemic heart disease without ECG changes. See this one that the symptom lasted for two hours. At the moment, patient doesn't have any symptom. Okay, and, and it was in the morning when the patient was exercising. What does it look like? It looks like an angina. It could be a presentation at that time, but if you do an ECG right now, you might not get anything. And you have to do further investigation to find this out. So you can send the patient for a stress test or any other tolerance test to see if there is any underlying ischemic heart disease going on. Okay, not all the time we get ST elevation in everyone, right? This patient's symptom is already gone and already improved. So you might not get anything in here. Alcoholic cardiomyopathy is not a very common condition, and we would not think alcoholic cardiomyopathy as our initial diagnosis anytime. We will try to rule out everything first, and then if still we can't find, this, find anything out, then it will become an alcoholic cardiomyopathy case. 
and patient will drink a lot like maybe 10 glass of wine every night that can give a alcoholic cardiomyopathy and same st depression is not always you will get in ecg st depression t wave inversion you you might get a completely normal ecg in a patient with angina or ischemic heart disease it, it's not always that we get everything That's right, Dr. Walker. So that's what we are trying to rule out here. We want to make sure that this was not an exercise-induced angina. And that's the best thing to do. You will always choose options which is important for, for a particular group. This patient, they are giving every cardiac risk factor. And if we choose just dehydration causing it, this is not right. You, will, you would even think that, well, if I just think it is dehydration, it's not right. This patient can, can be dead on the street next day when they go for exercise, okay? So we have to consider all of this factor when we choose an option. Next, ECG with bradycardia and prolonged QT. Patient came with chest pain for 15 minutes, which was relieved by rest. Troponin is normal. Pulse, normal and regular. Blood pressure normal, what to do next? Repeat troponin, echocardiogram, coronary angiography, repeat ECG. So you have got a patient who has got prolonged QT, bradycardia. Now the main thing is the patient had a chest pain for 15 minutes, which was relieved by rest. At the moment, troponin is normal, everything is normal. So are you going to repeat troponin, echo, angiogram, or you are happy to send the patient home? Let's say this is also another option. So ideally, any kind of chest pain which lasts more than 10 minutes, it can be unstable angina or acute coronary syndrome. So Unless you do multiple ECG and multiple troponin, you can't be sure. So anything like this, ideally you will do a repeat ECG first to, change, to check for any changes. And also you'll do a repeat troponin. So you will do both one and four, but which one is more, more like which one you would do first? Because they're asking next. Next is obviously ECG. ECG comes first and then we do troponin, okay? Very good. Next, a woman on multiple drugs. So let's say it's a 60 year old female on multiple drugs. One of them was digoxin. She presented with a central abdominal pain and tenderness, pulse irregular. Apart from CT, what is the most appropriate next investigation for her? So, what do you think in a 60 year old female? who is on digoxin, you have got, most likely they're talking about atrial fibrillation, right? And the, the digoxin, irregular pulse, everything goes with that. So a patient, 60 year old, coming to you with a central abdominal pain and tenderness. What is the likely chance of this? Very good, Dr. Adriel. It can be a case of acute mesenteric ischemia. Okay? And they say that apart from a CT abdomen, what will you do next? Abdominal ultrasound, serum lipase, serum lactate, or digoxin level? What would you look for when you are doing a CT scan? What an ultrasound can do? So you are already doing a CT scan. So why would we do a ultrasound? It's not going to add anything, right? So not doing an ultrasound it's not going to help anyway because you are you have already done a ct ct scan so this is serum lactate why first of all let's talk about acute mesenteric ischemia so acute mesenteric ischemia it's a very common complication of atrial fibrillation and you know that af patient gets clot and 
those, if a clot get dislodged and it becomes an emboli, that emboli can end up causing a blockage of the superior mesenteric artery. And that's what we call as acute mesenteric ischemia. So patients usually are elderly patients. They come to you with sudden onset of severe central abdominal pain. And the pain usually gets worse after eating. So there is a fear of eating. And they can also get profuse vomiting, watery or bloody diarrhea. And if you, if you palpate the abdomen, you will get localized tenderness, rigidity, and rebound tenderness over the central abdomen. So the main thing is that for this kind of patient, you have to do a CT angiogram to confirm the diagnosis. Many times, if it is really bad, patient will be taken to the surgical theater even without a CT angiogram. But they say that you are doing a CT angiogram in this patient. Along with that, what else can help you to diagnose or what else would you like to check? Whenever there is a ischemia, there is a lactic acid formation in that area. And most of the time, you will get a high lactate in those patients. So any kind of ischemia, because there is a lack of oxygen, there will be lactic acid, lactic acid production. And that's why you can just do a serum lactate, and that can also help you to understand that this is most likely an ischemic problem going on. Okay, clear? And the treatment for this is surgery. If Doppler ultrasound was given as response, Doppler for what? For acute mesenteric ischemia, Doppler is not the best test. We can do X-ray initially, but you have to do a CT angiogram. Doppler is not a best test for this. And one of you asked about, what about a stress echo? So I think you are talking about this one. Now, you can't do a stress echo just now. You, have, you will first need to rule out acute coronary syndrome in this patient. Once acute coronary syndrome is ruled out, then you can send the patient for a stress test. Okay, a 23-year-old man comes for follow-up. So let me just... Okay, a 23-year-old comes for follow-up, and you can see his bilateral arm blood pressure is between 140 to 160, which means that it is pretty high blood pressure, and you have done on several occasions. He gets occasional headaches, rest of the physical exam, urine analysis is normal, heart rate 75, mild left ventricular hypertrophy, and that can be due to hypertension. Patient has used beta blocker, hyagides, captopril, which means ARB, and blood pressure still is on the higher side. So this is resistant hypertension, right? You have used multiple drugs, but it's still blood pressure is high. And in a 23-year-old, that is very odd, right? So what is your next appropriate step? And what do you suspect in this patient? Yes, very good. It is most likely a renal artery stenosis. Okay, because you can see that resistant hypertension in a young patient like this, it is most likely a renal artery, renal artery stenosis case. So renal artery stenosis can be in young patient because of fibromuscular dysplasia, can be in older patient for atherosclerosis. So 
Renal artery stenosis should, should be considered as a cause of high blood pressure in people who are older than age 50 when they develop high blood pressure or have a marked increase in blood pressure. Okay, have no family history of high blood pressure, but most importantly, cannot be successfully treated with at least three or more different type of blood pressure medication. So our patient has got this, this one, which is the resistant hypertension. And in resistant hypertension, we would look for something, something like this, especially renal artery stenosis. And we discussed a little bit about renal artery stenosis. This is a secondary cause of hypertension and how we can diagnose that. Duplex ultrasound of renal artery, echo, repeat ECG, prescribe triumteran or ophthalmoscopy. We know that we have to do a duplex ultrasound in this patient, right? Very good. No, it's, ACE inhibitor is not contraindicated in renal artery stenosis. In unilateral renal artery stenosis, ACE or ARB can be given. And ideally, that is also a very good medication for them. But when it is bilateral renal artery stenosis, then you can't give ACE. Okay? And again, because 95% patient has essential hypertension, you can't do Doppler ultrasound on every patient who comes to you with hypertension. Good question, Dr. In Phoenix. Corn syndrome. So, Corn syndrome can give resistant hypertension. What exclude this one from this history? The main thing, as I say, always look at the option. Have, you, have we got anything to look for as a, as a Corn syndrome? In Corn syndrome, you would be looking for checking the electrolyte to check for sodium potassium changes, right? Nothing written in that in here for that. So very important clue to the diagnosis of Corn syndrome is your electrolyte change. If there is no electrolyte change, we just don't think about Corn syndrome as our first line. Okay, and it's a very uncommon diagnosis. So we always look for the common thing first, not an uncommon thing. And also Corns is not very, very common in a, in a young patient like this. If BP was different in both arms, can it be aortic dissection? Just because BP is different, we can't just think it is aortic dissection. Patient will be having a severe chest pain. Without having a severe chest pain, we just don't think about aortic dissection for everyone. Yes, if ACE is contraindicated, then calcium channel blocker will be the best idea. Next question. So you have got a patient, so let's say elderly patient, taking digoxin and hydrochlorothiazide, presents with palpitation, ECG given, what is the cause of his problem? So you have got a patient who is on digoxin, thiazide diuretics, coming to you with palpitation and ECG given. Let's have a look to the ECG. Now this will be tricky for you because we haven't discussed ECG at all. But what I can just show you is that it is a case of digoxin toxicity. Digoxin toxicity comes with a ST depression like this. It's called reverse tick sign. So if you look over here, especially let's look on the lead two. In lead two, you can see a bit of this reverse tick sign. Not very prominent, but if you look on this V4, V5, V6, you can see that this is isoelectric line. The ST depression is there. And this reverse tick sign is very, very classic presentation for digoxin toxicity. Okay, so this patient most likely has got digoxin toxicity based on the ECG. And on the top of that, yes, you can see that this patient is on thiazide diuretics, a patient developing hypokalemia, 
obviously that can also cause it. But the main part is that we have got features of digoxin toxicity on the ECG. So that's why it is not, we can't just say it is hypokalemia. We have to talk about digoxin toxicity in here. Okay. Now, some we, without checking the potassium level, we can't say it is hypokalemia just because the patient is on hypo, hydrochlorothiazide. Not everyone who is on thiazide diuretics will end up getting a hypokalemia. Okay. But at least we know in this patient that this patient has got ECG changes of digoxin toxicity. Okay. Now, you have got a patient who is on many medications. One of them is metoprolol, other is digoxin, fusamide, and ECG was given. This is the ECG. So, patient complains nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Digoxin level given, and it was normal. What will you do? So, these kind of questions are not coming a lot this nowadays. The reason is because digoxin is no longer our, our favorite medication. We have a lot of other good medications. So, but still, we should know about features of digoxin toxicity and how to, how to at least find those out in the ECG and everything. Remember one thing that a patient who is on digoxin can give digoxin toxicity even if the level is normal. So it's not only the level which, which helps us to find out the toxicity, it is mainly the symptoms. And you know that digoxin toxicity always has the main symptom of digoxin toxicity is nausea, vomiting. And they can also get abdominal pain. So even, if, even though digoxin level is normal, it still it can be a digoxin toxicity. Let's have a look on the ECG. And let's see what we have found here. So, if you look at lead two, what you see here, this is P wave, and then this is R wave. Now, you have got a prolonged PR interval in here. Normally, PR interval should be between three to five small square. And you have, in here, you can see it is at least five, six, seven, eight small square. So this patient has got, got prolonged PR interval. And we can see everywhere there is prolonged PR interval. Do you know in which condition you get a prolonged PR interval like this? First degree heart block. Very good, Dr. Saida. So when you get a prolonged PR interval like this, but there is no drop bit. That is first degree heart block. It is not Mobius type one or two because there is no drop bit here. So if there was a drop bit, then it was type two. But in here, because it is only prolonged PR interval, that is a first degree heart block. And remember, I told you that detoxin toxicity can give you any kind of arrhythmia. And heart block is also one kind of arrhythmia. And heart block also can be a feature of digoxin toxicity. So everything goes with digoxin toxicity in here. Patients' symptoms, ECG finding. So what will you do next? Are you going to siege digoxin, seize metoprolol, pacemaker, angiogram, seize metoprolol, comments to verapamil? What will you do? Yeah, so any kind of digoxin toxicity, you have to stop it. So Stop digoxin is the first thing that we would do. For first degree heart block, we don't need to give pacemaker. Between digoxin and metoprolol, both can reduce the heart rate. But we know that this patient has got toxicity of digoxin, so this is the priority. Okay? Same if you stop metoprolol and then start verapamil, it's not going to help anyway because both verapamil and metoprolol can reduce the heart rate. Ideally, we say any heart block patient, you have to stop anything which reduces the heart rate. Okay? But for this patient, the first thing I would do is to stop digoxin 
and then consider stopping the metaprolol if it is possible. The next question is you have got an ECG of WPW syndrome. Heart rate is obviously very high. Blood pressure is still not bad. What will you do? Now, again, we will discuss WPW syndrome in detail in our cardiac ECG class. But just get a basic idea about WPW syndrome. So, all of you know a little bit about the cardiac electrical impulse, how it works. So, the electrical activity starts from the AC node and then it goes to the AV node and then through the bundle of his Parkinson fibers, it goes to the whole ventricle and it helps the heart to pump the blood. This AV node helps with few other things. There is a, there is a thing called AV nodal delay. So this AV nodal delay helps to stop any abnormal rhythm coming from your, from your top part of the heart down to the ventricle. So even though there is abnormal impulse originating from supraventricular area, when it comes to this AV node, it can delay this rhythm and sometimes you will not even feel the palpitation because of this. But WPW syndrome is a condition in which there will be an accessory pathway which can bypass this AV node. So what can happen that any abnormal impulse that originate in the atrium, it can directly go to the ventricle. That's why you can see heart rate is very high. So the main thing is that still some of the impulse will go to the AV node. Not every impulse will go through the, this accessible pathway, right? So if you give any medication which, which blocks this AV node, then what will happen is that every impulse will go through this, this accessory pathway. So that's why in WPW syndrome, it is contraindicated to give any medication which can block this AV node. So what causes that? Beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, adenosine, digoxin, all of this can cause this. So these are all contraindicated in WPW syndrome. So only thing you can choose is antiarrhythmic medication. And in here you have got amiodarone. Okay, so that's the only option that you have got. And if this patient was vitally unstable, then again, you would go for DC cardioversion. Next question, a 65-year-old patient presented with lightheadedness and palpitation. Examination normal. He is on pedindropril, L-troxin. So L-troxin is thyroxin, verapamil, anti-diabetic medication, ECG showing first degree heart block. What is your next appropriate treatment? So it is a patient who has first degree heart block and also symptomatic. What would you do next? Increase the thyroxine, stop verapamil, stop pedindropil, or add digoxin. Yes, so you have to stop verapamil in here. Okay, because verapamil is a rate limiting calcium channel blocker. So you can't give anything which can reduce the heart rate in a heart block patient. Okay. Next, you have got a child with upper respiratory tract infection and you have treated the patient for infective endocarditis. Blood culture was taken and you have treated the patient with penicillin, but still there is murmur. Infective endocarditis can give a murmur because of the vegetation that develops in the heart. 
If murmur is there, it means it's still that vegetation is there, which means you haven't been able to treat the infective endocarditis completely. So to confirm that, what you can do? Are you, do you want to give antibiotic again? Do you want to do an echo? Repeat blood culture, switch to meropena. You have to do an echo, right? Very good, because you want to see that vegetation. And if you see that vegetation, then you can again, either you can do a blood culture and you can start the antibiotic again. Next, a pregnant woman at 36 weeks of gestation presents with dyspnea and orthopnea. X-ray shows bivasal effusion and cardiomegaly. On examination, there is basal crepitation. What is your next appropriate investigation? What's your diagnosis? 36 weeks, dyspnea, bivasal effusion, cardiomegaly. What's, what's you're looking for? Congestive cardiac failure, guys. Okay, so everything goes with congestive cardiac failure. You can see this patient having dyspnea, orthopnea. So that's one thing. Bivisular crepitation. So everything goes with acute pulmonary edema, or you can even say it's a cardi it's a congestive cardiac failure because of cardiomegaly, bivisular crepitation. So it's not pulmonary embolism based on the finding. It is unlikely to be cardiomyopathy. It can be, we, we don't know. But the, the thing that we know it is that it is most likely a CCF. So what is your next investigation? ECG, ECHO, D-dimer, or CTPA? Remember I told you, if you suspect something cardiac, you will, your next test is always ECG. And then you will do an echocardiogram for this patient to confirm the diagnosis. So they're asking next. Next is ECG. Very good. Have a look on this one, that you have got a patient who is having difficulty in breathing with faint heart sound. Saturation 96, blood pressure is dropping, JVP elevated, no ECG given. What is the investigation of choice? Tell me what is your diagnosis? So you have got hypotension, faint heart sound, raised JVP, cardiac tamponade. Very good. Very good, Dr. Saida, Dr. Jaina. So it's a big triad. Remember, big triad showing hypotension, muffled heart sound, and raised JVP. So for cardiac tamponade, what's your investigation of choice? They are not asking the next investigation. They're asking investigation of choice. So that's echocardiogram. Okay, very good. Next question, a hypertensive and a diabetic patient presents with history of numbness, nausea and sweating. So, it's a hypertensive, so let's say it's a 50-year-old male, hypertensive, diabetic. I'm coming to you with numbness, nausea, sweating. He developed dizziness while urinating. Pulse is irregular, so likely chance there is AF. So ECG shows AF. What is your diagnosis? Myocardial infarction, micturition syncope, vesovagal syncope. Yes, it is myocardial infarction. Diabetic patient can get a silent MI. Not needed that we, we don't need a we don't need a chest pain all the time. The main thing is that this patient is a 50 year old, hypertensive diabetic, high risk for ischemic heart disease. Doesn't matter while urinating, whatever he got, that's just a trap to make you choose this micturition syncope. 
okay so we would not think about micturition syncope in this patient given that he has nausea sweating dizziness all of this had a af af patient most of the time there is an underlying ischemic heart disease okay even though ecg is showing af at the moment we would we would do more investigations to find out if there is anything else going on so we'll do a troponin we'll do we'll do repeated ct repeated ecg and everything okay so mi is our first thing that we would think in this kind of patient always remember in exam i told you i think in one of the question if something is very obvious don't don't fall into that trap so they have already given that he developed a dizziness while urinating that's a very obvious thing given in terms of micturition syncope and this is usually just a trap for you to choose this but in exam you have to think as a whole not just a single point you, when you get such a patient in your hospital you would not think it is a micturition syncope you would do everything to find out if this patient has got a mi or not okay because of the risk factor so micturition syncope this is an uncommon event may occur after micturition in older men especially at night when they leave a warm bed and stand to void this cause appears to be peripheral vasodilation associated with reduction of venous return from straining so patient with micturition syncope they can get all the features they can get dizziness while urinating but the main problem is that we will only think of micturition syncope until we can rule this out if we rule out mi then we can diagnose micturition syncope in this patient okay now the last question for tonight you have got a elderly women brought after fall confused on warfarin bruises on the both thigh and buttock troponin is normal but ck is very high what is the diagnosis elderly women most likely had a fall couldn't get up was on the floor for a long time ended up getting a condition called rhabdomyolysis so what is rhabdomyolysis rhabdomyolysis is just like when someone is not moving for a long time patients most likely after a fall she might even had a had a fracture of the neck of the femur she couldn't stand up so the in those situations sometimes the muscle starts to break down releasing myoglobin into the circulation and myoglobin can be very risky for this patient especially it can cause kidney damage it can cause acute tubular necrosis or even a renal failure okay so early complication of rhabdomyolysis is hypovolemia it can increase the potassium decrease the calcium and in that way it can even cause cardiac arrhythmia so rhabdomyolysis means muscle tissue breakdown with release of myoglobin into circulation and th this will re this will cause elevated creatinine kinase you can get a dark reddish brown urine due to myoglobin urea patient also get muscle aches and pains and weakness okay this myoglobin can occlude the kidney and causing the renal failure so the treatment of choice for for patient who has rhabdomyolysis so initial treatment would be making sure patient is vitally stable so start the patient with iv fluid because this patient can get severely dehydrated and then treat the patient accordingly based on what complication they have developed but the main treatment is iv fluid okay all right so that brings us to the finishing of tonight class any question guys
So was it the last lecture on cardiology? It's not the last lecture. We still have a ECG class. So apart from ECG and palpitation, everything is done. Okay. And ECG class will, will be there after our, so we will have our next, so I think we will finish on Sunday, so your two week session. And then on 24th, we will have our orientation class. After orientation class, the next class will be ECG class. We will give a schedule of everything into your Facebook group. And that's, that group is named as uh, Frustrated AMC MCQ batch nine so all of you who will join it will be in the batch nine that's the online batch we are having currently and in that batch everything will be given all the all the next schedules and all okay yeah infective endocarditis is a part of infectious disease these lessons will not be repeated. This is a part of the course. So everything that we have discussed so far, that's a part of the course already. It will not be rediscussed. Okay, so I'm hoping that you guys are liking the class. And I'm hoping that we can satisfy what you want from us. And I'm hoping that if you can finish everything with us, there is nothing you need. You can pass this exam. Nice and easy. And this, this is a five month course, so most likely it is going to be end on, on early March. Yeah, if it is a case of rhabdomyolysis, most of the time CK level will be provided. And even by the look of the question, you will know that they're talking about rhabdomyolysis. Patient had a fall for a prolonged time, couldn't get up. That's a classic scenario. Yes, so even though these classes will not be recorded, will not be repeated, Dr. Tandin, every classes recording are given on the portal. So if you miss a class, you can easily go through the recorded class. Okay, that's not a problem at all. Thank you, Dr. Wakas. So anyone having any questions, you can also unmute yourself and ask questions. We are finishing our free two week sessions very, very fast because not much classes are left, right? So is there any questions that you want to ask? All good then. So let's finish it here tonight. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Take care. Bye. I'm oh, sorry. I just had a question. Yes, Hello? Dr. Afifa. Hi. Sorry. Just the question I had was um, in one of the questions for HOCM, uh, the answer was verapamil, which is which is the first initial treatment. But in one of mm -hmm. your slides. Um, it said if there is syncope, then you would do defibrillation, like you would put in um, a defibrillator, right? But that wouldn't be the initial in, step. No. So the, the, we, we put that implantable cardioverter defibrillator. It's if a patient has got dilated cardiomyopathy with ejection yes. fraction less than 35, that's the only indication of implantable cardioverter defibrillator at the moment oh okay 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 i was just okay. confused because the slide was underneath yeah. hocm so mm. i thought that was the answer yeah. but okay thank you no worries to Africa. thank you for asking not a problem okay all right everyone any other questions all good so Thank you all. Have a good night. Take care. Bye.